how's my uh, graphic editing on that campaign pen? <laughs> it should say, uh, it was, the actual pen says leaders for a change. I thought that was an inspiration for the title. I thought women for a change. It's wonderful what you can do with Microsoft Word. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> Okay, let's get going here. Um, so just to give you an overview, we'll talk about the 1976 presidential campaign, uh, about once Carter is in office, uh, support for the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, and then the 1980 election, Carter basically defending his record on gender equality. So we'll go ahead and there we see Carter signing legis uh, legislation extending the deadline for the Equal Rights Amendment. So we'll actually start in a breakout room. We'll just take, uh, I guess we can maybe take three minutes uh, for this, but I wanted you not to just discuss this question, but think about how you would facilitate this to your students. Because my guess is you say this to your students, what does this mean? They, they, they might give you a blank stare, uh, but think about how you would say the maybe examples you could give to your students about political change, social change, economic change that's happened over time and then and the how that relates to our nation's motto e pluribus unum uh, out of many one uh, so Therese if you can go ahead and we'll get this program started with this first breakout room I'll see you guys all in a few minutes okay. okay so I hope we had some fruitful discussions there at least with some feasible examples of how we can get our students to, to talk about these things um, and it's pretty broad and it, you know, requires some, some previous knowledge, some prior knowledge. Uh, so hopefully what, if you are able to present this to your students in class, whether it's a part of this presentation or your own lesson plan, um, maybe you can connect it with whatever unit it is that your students are, uh, learning at that time. It's something to, to keep in mind. I think this guides when we're talking about civil rights, gender equality, things of that nature that national motto. Okay. Hold on right there. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we'll get started with the 1976 campaign for president where we saw Carter and Mondale very bright eyed and cheery there. They go back to their 1981s there. They look a little tired. <laughs> you can look up the kind of the same motif that they used four years later. Uh, but to look at think where things were in 1976, looking at the Ford administration, uh, there women accounted for 12% of uh, Ford's appointees. Uh, only cabinet member was Carla, female cabinet member was Carla Hills. Um, but Ford does support passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, as did Nixon before him. Uh, approves Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974. Basically, women could not apply for their own credit cards and credit accounts. Uh, prior to that, uh, he also signs a proclamation on Women's Equality Day in 1974. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the Nixon Ford Carter, just a side note, has multiple great examples of cooperation between presidential administrations. Many of the things that Carter accomplishes was things initiated in, in, in previous administrations, particularly Nixon and Ford. Uh, and he brings them to fruition. But I think it's a great reminder for students to know whenever you can remind them <laughs> about cooperation across administrations, sharing in our nation's success. Just when we look at campaign materials in 1976, I think they can speak uh, volumes. I mean, feel free to go in the chat and you know, type, you know, type in your impressions of what you think Ford's trying to communicate. What is, what's the message you're getting from Carter with the Allman brothers? Um, you know, they would frequently have him along with them on tour and he would come out on stage from tens of thousands of people and yell that, that you know, familiar line, I'm Jimmy Carter and I'm running for president. Um, Happy Days was on at the time, but it was more kind of beckoning back um, you know, to, a, to an earlier time, maybe something we see in subsequent presidential campaigns. But I think when we see examples of these, this almost kind of sets the tone for what was at stake. I think it's great that we can look at something as simple as a campaign button, a campaign poster, and deduce 
those different um, perspectives of, of presidential candidates. So when we look at the results of the 76 election, Carter gets 52% across the board between men and women. Ford gets 48%. So technically they do have equal support among the, among the genders. Uh, Carter has an electoral victory of 297 to 240. Now the big one here is women comprise more than 52% of the total voter turnout. And more people, and stay with me on this one, more people voted in 1976 than any previous election but voter turnout was down 10% from 1964. So I guess that what that says is we had more people registered to vote than ever. And, but, and because of that, despite the largest turnout, it was still the largest, uh, it was a, a downturn in percent of total voters uh, that came out. Um, McCarter it does successfully court women in the 1976 election. I, and, Despite seeing a 297 to 240, the actual votes were, uh, popular, popular vote was much closer. Carter really got by with the skin of his teeth. And I think it might have been in part thanks to the way he was appealing to voters during the 1976 campaign. So now that he's gotten into office, as with all presidents, now they have to be accountable for the things they've said on the campaign trail and the plans that they have. You see the photograph there of Jimmy Carter taking the oath of office as the 39th president, this January 20th, 1977. So again, going back to civics basics with, and I think this is important for students to return to anytime we analyze any crisis, historical event uh, in American history, like that they don't just pull solutions out of thin air. There is a playbook so to speak, and that is called the Constitution. So there's always congressional legislation available. That's Article One, Section One. You'll notice in the presentation I have hyperlinks. Um, I believe Trace will be providing you with a PDF. Those hyperlinks will still be active. Uh, there's executive action. And I think it's important to clarify to students what executive action actually is. It doesn't really take the place of a law. It's usually a president facilitating something that's already in existence that might not have specific direction on how to implement. That's often uh, what executive uh, orders tend to be. And those are in the news lately with things happening with the Supreme Court and the Biden administration, wearing a lot of things about executive actions that are on the table uh, that, his, that he could take. Uh, presidential appointments, um, and that kind of goes a long way in this on this topic of gender equality, that the president can appoint, uh, appoints ambassadors, public ministers, consuls, judges, Supreme Courts, and officers of the United States uh, be confirmed by the Senate, but so also remember um, a reminder of checks and balances and reminding students exactly what that phrase hears. They might hear it a lot and it doesn't quite register. It's showing that another branch of the government checks the power of another branch of the governments so that no one gets to act unilaterally. So one way that Carter engages women, he goes to engage women in business, something that had been often overlooked uh, by previous administrations. Uh, we saw that Ford had signed a law allowing women to apply for their own credit. So you can imagine this is a big deal uh, for women. See, so he, and he, uh, again, going back to things that were available to him, he does appoint women in his administration. As far as business, uh, Juanita Kreps uh, is appointed uh, for commerce. Um, the, we see the number of businesses owned by women rising uh, by more than a half a million between 1977 and 1980. So we see direct results of the actions of a president. And there is a more, you can read more extensive um, remarks on Carter uh, that he made the day that this photograph um, was taken. Uh, that hyperlink will be active for you, but again, that could be something you ask students to review or have them analyze, maybe with a document analysis sheet from the National Archives, uh, if you're familiar with those. There's a lot of ways you can go about. 
I, I think it's great to take this presentation I'm sending you and pick it apart, dissect it as you need to, if you just need it for a 20 minute activity or if you wanna present it in its entirety. There's a lot of ways you can go about it. Although I, I don't know if anyone else is laughing out there right now that there's that guy on the right, he really looks like he should have taken a bio break uh, before he attended Carter's press conference there. I'm sorry, I had to get that out of the way because I laugh every time I see this picture. So we'll keep moving here now that I've gotten the laugh out of the way. So again, I think making women feel heard because Carter is accountable to this segment of, of, of the voting population who's propelled him to the office. So we see a public servant being responsive to that. Again, building on the work of a previous administration. Uh, so Ford had the National Commission on the, Observa on the Obs Observance sorry, of the International Women's Year. Carter expands membership of that group from 35 to 45. Again, a great example of what an executive order does. It wasn't establishing that group. It was something already existing. Carter modified it with that executive order. Um, once that con uh, congressional statute ended for that group, Carter creates the, a new one, the Advisory Committee of the International Women's Year. So basically, same thing, different name. And we see a link to that executive order. So students, if you wanted them to, could see the actual language of that. So a little bit about that task force. So there's the quote at the top, exactly what it was meant to do to do promote equality for American women by ensuring that the needs of women are recognized and incorporated into federal policies and programs. So again, facilitating things. Um, and we see an example of the White House News. We have a lot of these in our collections at the Carter Library. Not all of them are digitized, but you can always go to our website, um, and submit an Ask an Archivist or Education Specialist form, uh, and we can uh, get an archivist on that. And if there's a, something specific, if you review our collections descriptions, we can get it digitized for you. So do please remember that as well. Some no notable administration appointments. Again, Carter is trying to reflect women in the government, something he's run on, uh, Mitch Costanza was assistant to the president for the public liaison. Uh, Juanita Kreps, again, Secretary of Commerce. She had quite an, uh, an illustrious uh, career in business. Uh, Patricia Roberts Harris actually serves in two cabinet positions. She was Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, she was instrumental in getting Carter's attention about what was going on in the Bronx in the 1970s, more or less the Bronx were on fire for a decade. Uh, because of some poor uh, public management there. Uh, but she also served as Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. And, and that's before uh, Carter creates the Department of Education. Uh, so that was a precursor to that. Now, when it comes to judiciary appointments, Carter appoints more women to the federal judiciary uh, judicial branch uh, than all previous 38 uh, administrations combined. Uh, he, some notable ones, as we see in the photograph here, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, also Stephen Breyer, who just retired. He appoints them as federal judges. They go on to be uh, nominated for Supreme Court justices by the uh, Clinton administration and uh, are approved by the Senate. Uh, but again, we see the news on the left, the Carter administration keeping people informed about what's going on, their efforts, uh, to have greater representation of women in the federal government, being responsive to the voters, to the people. So we just see one way that can be done. Again, we, you know, there's many other ways for presidents to communicate with the public. This is one aspect of that. So 1977 National Women's Conference was held um, in November of 1977 in Houston, Texas to address issues and topics concerning women. This was attended by multiple first ladies, uh, including Rosalind Carter, Betty Ford, uh, and Lady Bird Johnson. Uh, notable American artist there, uh, Maya Angelou, reads the Declaration of American Women Aloud, and I have a link 
uh, to that. Again, dissect it as you will, use it as you will with your students. And basically what they get out of this conference um, is a comprehensive report on the state of women's rights and gender equality uh, in the United States. And that report is called the Spirit of Houston. Uh, in the photograph there, we see the end of the torch relay. Uh, that began in Seneca Falls, uh, New York, a uh, place to visit there, women's rights national historic site administered by the National Park Service. Uh, and that torch relay ran all the way to Houston, Texas. So kind of borrowing from the Olympics there, uh, but one way that they brought attention uh, to this. So again, Carter takes advantage of legislation, uh, voted on, passed by Congress, signed by the president. A big one was the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978. As many of us may well know, prior to this, um, a woman who becomes pregnant could be terminated from her employment simply based on that. Uh, because of the assumption that she now has to uh, oversee all parenting duties for a child. Uh, so this is actually an amendment to Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And when we get a little further um, in the program, keep this in mind, uh, the question in, in the, that I'm going to pose in the break room, when we, we're going to be talking about amendments versus legislation advantages and disadvantages of each so we can see things can get i guess a lot of layers it can get a little complicated when it when it comes to addressing a broad topic such as gender equality um, and whether that can be accomplished through a constitutional amendment or a series of state and federal laws so at this point, we do not have an equal rights amendment, and this is the path that has been taken, as with other, uh, other uh, problems going on in society. So that brings us to the equal rights amendment, something looking to have a, a blanket solution, uh, something that's permanent uh, in our governing document. And there again, we see that, uh, I mentioned that about the relay from uh, New York to Houston. See some young people that are really enthusiastic about that. Maybe remind students this is how we did it before we had social media <laughs> and the internet. You, you know, the rubber hit the road, and you actually you really had to get out there. Not to say that young people aren't doing that now, but that was the choice. <laughs> there was no other option but to physically get out there, be seen, and be heard by the people you're trying to influence to make the change that you wanna see. A great example there, piling into the station wagon with no seat belts in the back. <laughs> so here is the language of the Equal Rights Amendment. I think this, it's, I find there's, there's a lot of very momentous things that have happened in history that we would think would be a little longer <laughs> text-wise, maybe thick like a book. Some of those things being a, a, an amendment to the Constitution, but here we see more or less it is just three um, sentences, uh, with the meat of it being one sentence. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That's it. That's really the whole thing. Um, you know, a comparison I think of off the top of my head, something Mark would be familiar with, would be uh, Truman's um, or United States recognition of the state of Israel, something you think would be you know, chapters, possibly. It's just a couple paragraphs. <laughs> um, and, that, and that set a lot of things in motion. This is kind of in that same class, just a simple sentence, simple paragraph, but very momentous. Now the options for amendments, there's actually two ways. We typically hear about two thirds majority in both houses of Congress, then it goes to the states where three quarters have to ratify. It can also begin with two thirds of the states holding a convention to approve the proposal. So it could either begin with Congress 
or with a convention of state legislators. So there are two roads to it there. Um, both are very difficult, I think, to get to, especially today in uh, more polarized times. It's interesting to imagine what today could get a two-thirds majority in both houses of Congress. That's something interesting to think about, maybe to deposit to students. But it's not, we have some gray area, though, when it comes to amendment ratifications. Article 5, um, which I encourage you to show to your students, makes no mention of ratification deadlines or a process to impose one. Um, it's maybe one of those not ex one of those powers not explicitly relegated to Congress or the judicial branch. So maybe there's an in for the executive here with that lack of language. However, there seems to be a tradition of when Congress and that two thirds majority passes a proposed amendment to the constitution that they insert language about a deadline. And so that was challenged at one point in Dillon versus Gloss, 1921. Um, and the Supreme Court more or less ruled Congress does have the power to impose a deadline uh, on, on proposed amendments. In that case, it was a seven year deadline and that has become uh, more or less the default standard of seven years. Uh, that is put in the ERA in its proposal clause. Uh, but then again, not in the language that's actually voted on the states who are ratifying it. So that causes a little bit of legal confusion around that, that uh, truthfully is continuing to this very moment. And the photograph we see there, Carter is signing a, an extension to that. That has been passed by Congress, um, extending that deadline three additional years to try to get three more states. At that time, they have 35 states uh, who have ratified uh, the Equal Rights Amendment of 1972. Um, but it's, a, it's tough going getting those last three. Carter is doing everything he can publicity wise, putting himself out there, uh, as did his predecessors, Ford and Nixon, uh, supporting this amendment. Uh, you know, when you analyze this, I mean, first off, it's two pages. That page on the left, you can kind of gloss over that. It's really a background, the history of it. On the right, Carter really gets into why it's personal to him. Um, and I think that's important for students in there, that it's not just Carter wait, waiting for something to come across his desk. Okay, this looks good, sign it. You know, this is something he's personally uh, invested in um, and that he's personally committed to, especially that very first uh, paragraph. He really kind of sums it up there, uh, that as a husband, a father, and a grandfather, I support the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, I do not believe my daughter should have fewer rights than my sons. Uh, so it really sums up his feelings um, right there. But again, a great document to show students the level of commitment of an American president to something that he's publicly supporting. Something also I think is great to remind students about that there is nothing <laughs> in our constitution about the requirements of the first lady or the first partner of uh, the President of the United States. There's no job description, uh, nothing whatsoever. They have to do X, Y, and Z. So every first lady that comes and first par or first partner going forward that comes into that position really makes it their own. Uh, Rosalind Carter was noted for being a champion of mental health as first lady of Georgia and first lady of the nation. She was also a very active supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment, as we see evidenced in this photograph from the National Archives. Again, we see the uh, other first ladies uh, behind her there. Um, we see Betty Ford standing behind her. Uh, in addition, she would receive numerous women organizations to the White House. Again, letting them know, even if they're not directly meeting with the president, letting them know that the White House knows they're out there. It's acknowledging them bringing them on site. Uh, she personally reached out to state legislators 
you know, try and encourage them, uh, trying to get passage of it within their state legislatures. So she's really right in step there with the president, uh, doing the legwork, trying to get this passed. So it's a great example to show, I think, the potential of of being the uh, the first partner in the White House. That even though you don't have that title of president, you still have a great platform um, to speak from and to, and to influence things happening in our nation that affect all Americans. And, uh, Rosalind Carter was also in strategy sessions. She was in cabinet meetings um, on a regular basis. We have photographs in our collections of uh, Rosalind Carter being in the same room with Secretary of State, um, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisors, Vice President, you name it, she's there. So Jimmy Carter, in this case, he always uh, touted uh, Rosalind, or continues to tout Rosalind as his closest advisor. He made that evident. We can find evidence of that in the National Archives, whether written or visual. So that offers us multiple perspectives. And I also want to present the other side of the argument to, to the ERA, because there are two sides to every story. Again, we want to embrace multiple perspectives with our students. Uh, we see a letter from Phyllis Schlafly uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, voicing her opinion about um, reservations she has about the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, mainly that if this is passed, her daughter, other young women, will be included in uh, the Selective Service Act. Um, and she sees, we see her, and that's, be, that's in the previous administration that's being sent to uh, the Ford. This is from the Ford Library. Uh, and it's part of their collections on the right. We see a woman uh, campaigning in public there, stop ERA. We see her reasoning behind her for God, home, and country. Um, also, at different times, students might notice the full ashtray of cigarettes on her desk. The smoking in public place is still permitted, but we can see the passion, the, the emotion, you know, in this person's face. That you know, they are. This is something they're passionate about. So, I think when we talk about gender equality, we do have to talk about, you know, both sides of that argument, where they're coming from. Why was there this? hill for advocates to climb up. What was the opposition? What were their concerns? Were their concerns genuine? You know, maybe send students on a fact-finding mission. In fact, uh, with this letter, I believe uh, Trace will be providing you with a, a separate activity I, that the Carter Library designed uh, called the ERA and U, from, uh, grades eight through 12. And I think included in that exercise is having students um, go to the Selective Service uh, website and read exactly how that law works. And then, especially in regards to an equal rights amendment, I think might be a little surprised. Some other concerns that, that women had and, up, and those opposed to the ERA had uh, were that labor law protections for women could be questioned, uh, that the right to alimony during separation uh, or after divorce might be jeopardized. Uh, and, and also the tendency for women to win custody of children in divorce cases, potentially compromised. So again, in the absence of a constitutional amendment, the approach has been a conglomeration of state and federal laws. And so we go back and we remember that very simple sentence in the proposed amendment. Does that simple sentence cover all of these existing state and federal laws. I mean, I mean, it seems to be a legitimate concern. It's very vague. We don't know if it's going to attest to, um, you know, custody in court, alimony, you know, on the job. Um, so those are, I think, very. Um, I think those are legitimate concerns that a lot of people had, given the language that had been provided to them, and and given that this was something unprecedented that we. We just didn't know how it would be interpreted by the judicial branch going forward or in future generations when composure of the court could change. Uh, through all this, Jimmy Carter is nonetheless very optimistic <laughs> that they're going to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed. So again, further evidence of a president 
uh, injecting themselves into the issue, not being hands off, not saying we're just going to abide by what the states ratify, um, really putting themselves out there, taking a huge calculated risk as presidents often must take when there is something they want to get accomplished in their agenda. But we can take a minute to read over Carter's, uh, Carter's words here. We can imagine this may be factors into difficulties he faces in the 1980 election. Because uh, here we do see politicians saying something very succinctly that they're going to deliver on. Um, ultimately, though, Carter is not able to deliver on the problems that this will, this amendment will get ratified. It's pretty complicated, again, because of uh, vague language used in Article 5 of the Constitution. Um, and then even with the Dillon versus Gloss, an argument can be made that the seven-year deadline is in proposed language that Congress voted on. When it gets to the states, they don't see that. They just see that language of the amendment. So they weren't voting on a deadline, but arguments um, go both ways. So we see that there were states that ratified it, and it remained ratified through the extended deadline of uh, 1982. Uh, we see ones that maybe only ratified it in one house of their legislature, but not the other. Some ratified and then revoked it before the 82 deadline. Again, is that valid? Um, there's no clear guidance or um, precedent for that. Uh, and then we have three states that ratified it after the deadline who are going by that argument of, States did not vote on something containing a deadline. Congress did, we didn't. Uh, that's out there. Um, and then you have ratified and just straight up revoked after the deadline. Can you revoke it after? But then the deadline has passed, you had your chance. But then again, they might say, well, Congress never had the right to, to have a deadline or we didn't vote on a deadline. So we can revoke it just like you can vote on it after, we can vote on it after in the negative. Uh, so it's really, a, a, a legal quagmire, I'd say, uh, that the ERA presents us with, and just any constitutional amendment going forward presents us with, uh, without cl very clear, concise uh, language or an amendment to that language. It almost seems that is warranted, that there should be an amendment to Article 5 to include language about deadlines and when states can and can't uh, revoke ratification or vote on <laughs> ratify after a fact. I think that would be a great topic of conversation with students or how would you craft that language? So we're gonna have another breakout room here. And again, with some prior knowledge that we have here, again, thinking about how you would pose this to your students and related to the, the, the uh, material you're teaching, but can federal or state laws be an adequate substitute for a constitutional amendment, which is more or less what opponents of the ERA um, were arguing, I think, continue to argue today, that we have federal laws, state laws that can accomplish what you're trying to do. We don't need to have uh, a blanket amendment. Um, talk about what are the advantages and disadvantages of each. Again, that requires some prior knowledge of what exactly in a constitution to the amendment means as far as um, um, legal rights for American citizens and what do laws mean and what is the nature of a state or federal law. So we'll go ahead and break, go into some breakout rooms for uh, three minutes there again, talk with each other about that. Again, really though thinking about it, how it would be, how you would have a feasible conversation with students about this and how you would facilitate that. This isn't always an easy question for students to answer. I imagine posing this question to students, getting a lot of blank faces back. Again, it's all about facilitating and making it relevant to them and realizing how it impacts their lives. Let's see. So get into 1980. So Carter's had 
uh, his first term in the White House, looking forward to his second term. Uh, I think the graphic on the right, really powerful one, showing all of the presidential appointees that were female in his administration. Um, just something to note, that's, um, let's see, third row up from the bottom, fourth in from the right is an appointee, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Goes on to be first lady, secretary, um, Senate, senator from New York, secretary of state, uh, and Democratic uh, candidate for president in the 2016 election. So here is kind of a breakdown on where the Carter administration is at making progress as far as women in government. Uh, we see within Congress, um, we see some changes that happened there. It's kind of putting it in, in stark statistics to help students understand why, why is there this clamor for equal rights amendment or even for the state and federal laws um, that have occurred. We see in US history, 103 women served in Congress com at that point compared to 11,400 men. Um, Let's see below in the Senate, one woman senator in the 96th Congress. Um, let's see, House of Representatives. Let's see, we had 19 in 1975. Again, the federal judiciary is one that Carter really leaves a lasting imprint on. Uh, and that's showing the power of executive authority there. That's one that Carter, in conjunction with Senate approval, um, was able to have with that big impact. So he, as mentioned, appoints more women than all the previous 38 combined. Women in state legislatures, the numbers rise from 4.1% in 1969 to 10.3% uh, in 1979. So we're seeing tangible results here from, uh, from these various campaigns over the years for gender equality. Uh, even statewide elected offices rises uh, slightly in that time. So the rest of that document, we can see. Go ahead and just look at some of those. Oh, let's see, I'm checking the chat real quick. Let's see, someone remembers Nancy, uh, I think on the last slide, from the senator from Kansas not having a restroom. For women in the Senate. All right. You can imagine those complications they faced after they got over the hurdles to get to Washington. Let's see anything else jumping out to anyone in the chat um, on some of the statistics that we're looking at right here? You see a big one overall that Carter had about 21% of his presidential appointments um, by May 79 were women compared to 12% in the Ford administration. Again, seeing things that are within the power of a president to affect. See, someone has asked, why did states revoke the ERA? So I would guess that would be a change in the, in the composition of the legislators legislatures. Um, the Stop ERA campaign was very uh, effective and very well organized. That had an impact um, nationwide. So I think that also factored into states reversing course. Um, things were getting a little more partisan at that point in history. Um, we have to go back and think about the composure of Republican parties and Democratic parties in the 1970s. Um, it, it's definitely not where we're at today. Uh, things were a little more gray then. Uh, more or less, both parties were focused on keeping the lights on, so to speak, uh, in the country. A lot of those social issues were just coming to the surface uh, at that time. Um, so, yeah, different time. Okay, we'll go ahead and move to the next slide. So here's the 80 campaign. We saw in 1976, Carter's kind of got the rock and roll president vibe going uh, toward the Allman Brothers making appearances with Willie Nelson. 
he gets a little more focus towards women um, in the 1980 uh, campaign. I'll go ahead and play a couple of those. We've got uh, Mary Tyler Moore up first. The countdown. <laughs> I'm Mary Tyler Moore, and I'm here to talk to women for a minute. Uh, but men are more than welcome to listen to. And please don't take my advice just because I'm a familiar face. This is something you'll have to think out for yourself. President Carter's attitude toward the women of America is clear and constructive and forward-looking. And his attitude is reflected in action. He's appointed more women to high-level jobs than any president in history. He's been consistently in favor of any legislation that would give women equal rights. Nearly half this country's women now work outside their homes, as I do. In fact, we've become a nation of two-job families. And President Carter wants our women to be able to cut through the years of disdain and delay to get the guarantees in the home and in the world that they need. This isn't a one-issue election, of course. But men and women truly concerned about women's freedom are going to vote for President Jimmy Carter. I know I am. Join Mary Tyler Moore in re-electing President Carter. Now that picture of that picture of Carter and Mondale at the end was the one I was referring to at the beginning of the program, where after they've uh, been worn down by the office, not so bright and shining. <laughs> so we'll play another one here. That countdown, bear with me. These are accessible on the Carter Library YouTube page, and I have the link. There are more and more women who are in the same position that I am in, and I think it's very. Oh, I'm sorry, I did not mean to do that. Very important that a woman be able to support her family because it's happening more every day. That that's a uh, necessity. Carol Quick is one of 26 million American women for whom work is a necessity. Well, I don't see myself as a militant at all. <laughs> I just see myself as a um, supporter of my family. I think that President Carter has definitely made an awareness of women for the nation. And he's done many things that I feel are for working women. Good one. I mean, a lot of women are married and work and are contributing to their family. And I think they deserve equal rights as well. Yeah. This is why I support President Carter, because I personally feel like he supports me. Okay, so we, so we see that the contrast um, that that last one was making that she mentioned something interesting that she's not militant, and I think that was a characterization that was given to women that they see marching, you know, you know, yelling, pumping fists in your signs, all that. These are militant people, and we see that you know that that's really you know this. This is communicating that's not the case. This is a working mother. She, we see her with in, on the job. We see her at home. Uh, so they're really trying to get that message out uh, to the average housewife because maybe they feel like they've been mischaracterized. Um, Mary Tyler Moore giving some statistics there and using a little bit of pop culture again. Um, so we see Carter now. He's got results to run on, not just promises. I'm trying to get out of the video now. <laughs> okay, out of the video. So this is a summary from a document called "The Record of Jimmy Carter: Something to Be Viewed, you know, Through a Lens of Bias." This was something written by the Carter administration, and in this section, I think they summarize what they feel they have. Uh, accomplished in their four years in office. Um, we see extension for three years of the ERA ratification deadline. Uh, let me go down to those bullet points there. Um, appointment of more Blacks, Hispanics, and women to cabinet, sub-cabinet, White House, and other senior management positions than any other president. We see the judgeships there, judicial branch, federal judicial branch, Appointment of more Blacks, Hispanics, and women than all previous 38 presidents combined. Um, so they, Carter definitely has things 
to run on in regards to gender equality in the 1980 election. It's not just um, all unfulfilled promises. I think things that have been within the power of the executive branch um, have, have been uh, done um, towards building a more equitable society in terms of gender equality. So that's, we can show students, here's a president, again, communicating to the public what they have done, why they should be reelected and given four more years in office. Okay, and this will be, and we're kind of winding down here, one last breakout room, but this is a great open-ended question, I think, to ask students. Um, is it important for people serving in our government to reflect our nation's diversity? Because it seems that Carter really put a lot into this, that he felt it was very important that women see themselves in government, not just men telling them that they're thinking about them, that they're going to do things on their behalf. Um, he really put the egg, a lot of his eggs into that basket of, well, we have women in government. ERA might not be passed, but if you look at my cabinet, look at the overall numbers, not just in my government, perhaps that's influenced elections at the state level, the local level, because we have seen those increases across the board. Um, is that something the president should be focusing on? Why or why not? So we'll go ahead and get in some our breakout rooms for a few minutes there, for three minutes again, uh, and discuss this again, how we present this to the students. How do you facilitate that conversation with students to get meaningful responses? So I'm getting short on time. I'd hope to maybe elaborate and hear from some folks on responses there. Uh, but Mark told me we're, we're just about at the end. We're at 12 o'clock now. Uh, so I just wanted to review the, uh, some links I include in the present presentation for further inquiry. Uh, one was a recent document I mentioned, the record of Jimmy Carter. So that's record of everything that his administration uh, did. So you can pull that primary source for um, multiple subjects that you might be going over with your students. Uh, I have a link to the records of the Office of the Assistant to the President for Women's Affairs. Uh, again, if you go to our website, we have descriptions for our collections for every container. Um, and when you have further questions, if it's not digitized, fill out that Ask an Archivist form or Ask an Education Specialist form. And so one of us will get back to you and elaborate on that, provide you what you need. Uh, Ann Wexler was a special assistant to the president. She's got some great stuff. And, in her collection. Um, also a link to, op again, both sides of the story, opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, let's see, the Ford Library uh, has a lot of great holdings related to women's rights as well. And again, uh, I believe Teresa will be sending you the education activity, Equal Rights Amendment and You. It's also posted on the Carter Library website under teacher resources. Um, so that's the presentation. Uh, Mark, you tell me if I have time for questions. If not, I'm happy to let you all move on. Do what you got to yeah, do. Probably one or two questions. We're going to keep it real short. I apologize. I did want to tell uh, everyone I just dropped dropped the uh, link in the chat okay. to the uh, presentation and the activity are both linked on that page when you go to that link that we put online. But maybe um, take a couple of questions. We'll try and keep it pretty short if we can because we're getting really close on time. And I see there are some things in the chat, maybe. Yeah, yeah there's one there about the hostage crisis. And there's also one about the anti-boycott. So there's a couple of questions already there. Okay. Let's see, and, it's all and if I can read those two, if you'd like, Josh. Sure. One, say, can you describe the anti-boycott point that you had made? The anti-boycott point I had made. I'm sorry, what, what was the anti-boycott point I made? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they'll clarify that. We'll go to the next one while somebody retypes. Do you okay. think if the hostage crisis would not have happened, mm. Carter would have done better in re-election? I mean, I, that's you know we can we can imagine what would have happened. I mean, the hostage crisis affected us on multiple fronts. I mean, it was a matter of national pride, okay. also a matter of the, of the pocketbook. Um, the Camp David Accords, noble as they sound, was an effort of our country to stabilize global oil markets in the Middle East, which they thought they had achieved with getting Egypt and Israel to make peace because Egypt was typically spearheading 
most of the, uh, at least the Arab side of the Arab-Israeli conflicts. Uh, they thought they had that under wraps. Um, the uh, revolution happens in Iran. They nationalize their oil supply. The price of oil goes up. Oh, I think it's something like 300% at that time. Um, so I, I think had that not happened, he would have had a much better chance. <laughs> Who's to say if he would have beaten Reagan, but chances probably would have been better uh, for that. Okay, um, so it's all about the economy. Part of the Carter legacy boycott. I'm still not understanding the Carter legacy boycott. Maybe they can email the library with that one. Yes, so you can on that a bit more. Uh, in fact, I'll put my address in the chat there. I'll do that. I want to thank Josh for his presentation. I really appreciate it and all the great resources and teaching activity. So thank you, Josh, for your presentation today. Oh, really appreciate welcome. it. Always does a wonderful job and great, great resources at the Carter Library.